Hi, this is your host Sapnil Bhartia and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us once again, Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of Rack. And today we are going to talk about the license change at HashiCorp, where they have moved their products from open source licenses to a business source license, which of course is not in a sense open source. It's a controversial topic and blogosphere is already flooded with journalists uh, writing their opinions. We want to steer clear of all that controversy and focus on people that really matter, people uh, like customers that we serve, people like the whole ecosystem that is built around these technologies. So Rob, can you just quickly tell us what happened here? I'd be happy to swap. I, and I, I like the framing here. I think you know a lot of these, these open source controversies are very interesting to the industry wonks and um, more confusing than anything else to the, the end users and people who try and consume the technology. And so I, I'm happy to try and shine some light there. What what happened is is ultimately very simple. Um, HashiCorp, which is a publicly traded company, has um, a suite of very influential and um, important products in the industry, um, had been effectively been an open core company up until last week. So the core products that they build their business on, um, things like Vault and Terraform, um, they have a long list of them. Those are the two most well-known. Um, those products had been in with a permissive open source license um, up until last week. And then last week, HashiCorp made a decision to change the license, which is a going forward action. They can't do this retroactively, but going forward, um, all of the code bases or significant parts of the code bases of, of all of the HashiCorp products would be li licensed under this business uh, software license, which restricts the use of their products and that code. The code's still available, but you can't use that code in ways that compete with HashiCorp or get embedded into other products. Um, and so it's a pretty restrictive license from the perspective of what the mar how the market had been using these formerly open source projects. And how do you draw a line between a project and a product as these things can become confusing at times? <laughs> it has always been a challenge to do that. Uh, a project is really the code base. It is the simplest way I, I like to think of it. It's the people, it's the collaboration, it's the you know, it's the software bits. But once the that software gets compiled into a downloadable artifact, I consider that a product. Now, there's a lot of times when it's indistinguishable because somebody will just compile that code and then put it out there, and then it the product is very similar to the project. But um, the difference with a product is that you end up being able to call somebody up and then fix it. And they take responsibility for the patching, the fixing, building, maintenance, support, all the things that actually go into making that uh, the code into actually a business sustaining artifact. Um, if you don't want to do that from an open source perspective, what you would do is you would take that source code and you would build your own copy of it. You create your own binary. Uh, and that very, 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 very few people ever choose to do. Um, it's one of the reasons companies like Red Hat and Canonical exist and SUSE, because they are literally taking the Linux source code, which is open, and anybody could build a copy of, of Linux, and a lot of people uh, do for that project. Um, but most companies consume it through somebody who has gone through the effort to build and compile a distro. And, and we have actually similar arguments to what we're talking about with HashiCorp going in, on in the Linux community around CentOS or around um, Elastic and React and even back in the Docker days. A lot of what we're going to talk about probably feels very Docker and uh, big Docker, the company and little Docker, the, the project, um, very similar dynamics going on here. You and I, we have recorded so many episodes on this topic. We did actually a show with Dirk Honda, and we covered this topic, and he had some great insights on this topic as a veteran in open source world. Uh, we actually, <laughs> you and I talked about the whole Red Hat thing where they changes made changes to CentOS. What I do want to talk about uh, with you is that we used to hear about this thing at a smaller scale, but now it's happening at a much larger scale. What do you think is driving companies 
who were once champions of open source to take such steps? One of the challenges, there's, there's two market sources here that are really difficult um, to navigate for any company. And, and it's very important to remember, HashiCorp is a company and they're, they're, they're publicly traded. They have a duty to shareholders um, to sustain themselves. And, and, you know, people can read their public filings and, and see how much, literally how much money they make from, from selling these products and how much money they sell, they make from selling services, supporting the products. Um, but there were, there were two challenges here. One of them is that um, their prod, the, the code, the products, the things they built ha- are widely embedded in other people's products, either in a way that you can't see or a lot of times in a way that you do see. So for Terraform specifically, there's a number of companies that are basically Terraform orchestrators where they've provided an API in front of Terraform to run workloads and then they offer that as a product. Um, and so from Terraform, Terraform, uh, HashiCorp has a competing product called Terraform Cloud. And so literally its core technology is being used as a driver, um, for competitive products. Um, and I'm using Terraform as an example. There's, there's example, it, it's, it, their, their core technologies are being used in competitive situations, um, for them. And, and that's, commercially very difficult for you to invest in maintaining a core technology and then see other people profit from it. It's sort of the idea for open source, but it's if it's too one-sided, open source falls apart. The other component here is that um, the way the market is structured at the moment, it's very difficult to be a software company. Um, most of the revenue for software is being directed to SaaS companies. And so, one of the challenges here is that if you're spending a lot of investment time building software like HashiCorp does, um, and then other people pick that up and use it in their SaaS, this has been a common uh, argument against what Amazon does and how Amazon's done in other open source scenarios. Um, a lot of times you can monetize that software through the SaaS um, very, very effectively, and none of that flows back to the originators of the software. So they were they were sort of getting hit in a double squeeze. Their competitors were using were embedding their software and taking advantage of it and they were competing with their SaaS monetization play. Um, and that that's a hard thing to watch happen. Um, you know, some companies can, but it's a hard thing to watch happen. And it's not dissimilar. I think similar similar dynamics are happening to other companies that, like Red Hat that have, have worked very hard to uh, have an open source brand, but then that openness allows competitors to come in and um, you know, take revenue from them. And, so, I, and take revenue, so I should, I should say take revenue is a very, is, is from the perspective of the, the, the vendor in this case, um, you know, the competitors might have different feelings based on the way they perceive open source or what they're trying to do in market or what they're actually building. Um, but it's it, you know, it's not hard to see uh, somebody working, spending a lot of investment in this software, seeing it as a taking. And I I hear both sides of stories uh, when I talk to these companies. I do hear and see their side of stories as well. And even if they may or may not uh, admit, uh, the issue is becoming that some of these licenses were written in the ages when software was. Uh, downloaded and installed on client machine. You had to give changes back when you redistribute the code. You're like kind of restricted or allowed by the license to do so. But in the cloud-centric world where most of the things are being offered as software as service, it has changed everything as you no longer have to distribute anything. So you're not kind of compelled to release their changes or to get actively involved with the community is actually the fact is that most of these companies, they are actively involved because their own product rely on these uh, projects. But license is uh, becoming a critical uh, kind of piece here. What used to be a model for collaboration is now being weaponized. Don't you think that we may actually need new licenses which are written for modern SaaS cloud-centric world? Because as companies are coming out with their own licenses, it reminds me of the early days of Linux kernel itself. When Linux was, when I talked to him, he was like, there are so many licenses that it was really hard to see which license is compatible with what. So when the GPLv2 came out, 
he he liked the license because it makes things so easier. You don't have to go to lawyers to discuss <laughs> license. Uh, what do you think uh, organizations like OSI or FSF should do uh, to come up with the kind of license which is created for modern SaaS centric but the but the challenge is that most of these SaaS players are also biggest stakeholders so it will be more or less like you know working against their own interests so it's a very complicated uh, field it is not as simply as saying hey you know what the cloud is taking away all your businesses or it's saying that hey by changing license you are alienating your uh, contributors it's much more complicated than that, but I want to hear your thoughts on that. What do you think about coming up with uh, new licenses? Uh, it's a really good question and very thoughtful. Um, you know, I don't think that this is a licensing problem. I, I think that this is a cross of business markets and business models more than a licensing problem. The, the purpose of the licensing is to allow collaboration. And, and they do a very good job of allowing collaboration. The, the challenge we have, and, and I think people have abused the business models and created, used open source models to get market adoption without building collaborative infrastructures, right? Hashi, HashiCorp in this case owns, just like we had the same, we have the same problem. Every, every example we've named so far, the, the, the company that's running the project isn't collaborating, didn't set things up in a broad market situation to collaborate. And so it's not a, a shame on them. It's just that, that they're using an, a collaborative collaboration based license in a way where they are maintaining control of the infrastructure. And so I think what's, what goes on here is that those licenses are very well structured. If you have something that is inherently a multi author collaborative good, right? And I've been involved in a lot of projects where, where that worked. It was very important and it was a driver for how things how things went. Um, the challenge that we have is the predominant business model for monetizing things is uh, SaaS at the moment. And so it's, it's very hard to monetize an open source collaborative framework if you are trying to protect the IP for that. And so SaaS makes, you know, when you're doing a SaaS, nobody cares about the license, it's a service. And so what that allows people to do is they take a business model where nobody cares about the license. They only care about the APIs and the cost of the service and, and how well it's run. And the license is completely lost in that case. And so what, what happens is the SaaS is then able to use these collaborative licenses in ways that frankly aren't collaborative. And, and that's the essence of the, the challenge here. And it leaves a company that is looking for using SaaS as its main monetization strategy or even open source's main monetization strategy. Um, you have to be able to um, have a go to market where you are able to you know, basically provide something that people want to buy from you on, on top of what that tech is. And there's lots of great examples where that works really well. Linux is a fantastic example of that type of community programming languages, uh, some of the, the, the UX frameworks. There are lots of good examples of places where we've seen collaboration and synergies around that. But even things like ARM now are coming under some, some scrutiny on, on how it's taking its work and then pro providing licenses for those things. And, and this always is gonna come, it's a recurring theme that people who are looking to use open source and embrace open source in their in their in their companies and their products, which is everybody, um, needs to be aware of: Are they using community open source where the licenses are aligned with the the community, or are they consuming something where they're not aligned? And I, I think that's the fundamental question here: is not whether the licenses are good or bad. It's a it's a question of is the market aligned? Is the, the sustaining motion of that software aligned around the way you're consuming it? And if you're out of if you're out of alignment on that, then you need to really be evaluating what you're doing with that software and what the longevity of that software is. Since we are talking about ecosystem, what kind of impact is this going to have on the ecosystem ecosystem of partners, folks like Rackin, who not only leverage things like Terraform, but you folks also actively engage and contribute to some of uh, these open source projects that you rely on. Um, a much bigger problem that I see is also what kind of impact there is going to be on customers, which are of course customers of Hashi, at the same time customers of 
companies like Rackan who are using these technologies? What does it mean for them? Oh my goodness, um, this is this is a, an interesting ball of yarn to un, untangle because um, there's right now there's there's active discussion of forking those the projects that HashiCorp has had to move them into a community main, maintained system. Um, so the, the the idea would be you would fork it before the license changed, and then you would create a, a, a foundation or a group of like minded people to actually create the software, maintain the software in a collaborative style. Um, and in a lot of cases, the HashiCorp products, the projects behind the products have enough ecosystem behind them that you could actually now create a collaborative um, group of maintainers for those projects. Now it's a fork, so it's going to drift away from what HashiCorp is doing. And that's going to create a lot of market confusion and uncertainty over time, because all of a sudden we start having to ask questions of, are these compatible? If I'm using the HashiCorp Terraform, is it going to work with the open? Um, you're certainly not going to be able to use the trademark for Terraform, but I'm going to call it open Terraform for the moment. Um, open TF, let's do that, because that might survive trademark scrutiny in the future. Um, and so, right, so the binary compatibility of those things will drift. Um, and and it really has to drift. And so you get questions of, do all the providers that exist work with both platforms? Does, does, does HashiCorp make changes to the Terraform code so that it isn't compatible because they're trying to force customers to choose? It really creates a lot of confusion for people in the market who are used to using these, these products. And, and in all likelihood, almost as a requirement, those things will drift. Now, it's possible that the collaborative effort will fade because all of a sudden, a lot of the business models that people have assumed they could embed HashiCorp products into their their own products and SaaS services, those things are now in question and they might be going to look for alternatives. They might also be, I think what HashiCorp would like is calling them up and getting licenses so that they actually are, are in compliance and continue to stay on the code base. Um, you know, and and some of the the market will do some of each of those things. Um, the the bigger challenge here is how replaceable are those projects, and what companies can actually do to to, to make substitutions. And one of the things that that I found is that you know when we design rack end design software, we work really hard to identify abstraction points and ensure that when we are using tools, they we've built abstraction points in front of them sort of more foundational pieces like a machine rather than a, you know, a Dell, HP, Lenovo, or a VM or a cloud. Like we wrap those things in front of resource brokers. And, um, the, you know, so we work to build abstraction points into everything we do. And the most durable customers that we've seen in these cases, and as I've worked across the industry for, for decades now, the most durable actions are when you identify tools that you're using and then provide an abstraction layer in front of them to isolate you from these types of changes. Because at the end of the day, what we're seeing HashiCorp doing right now is not a surprise. It's it's something that, you know, watching the market from for, even before they went public, there was, there was you know, a risk, um, potentially a growing, I would argue a growing risk, that they would need to take an action like this um, in market. And so... You know, anytime you use a product and embed it into your, your systems, open source or proprietary, it is very important that you understand you, know, you have an alignment with how that product is, is supported and monetized and that you understand how to build abstractions around it and potentially have alternatives and replacement. That's just good supply chain management. Um, and so one of the takeaways here is, is, is right, every, everybody using any product should understand that, that supply chain. As an advocate of open source, I always believe that open source or these licenses are more about people. It's about uh, enabling people to collaborate. It's, it's, it's not that much about, hey, you know what, you can see the code. It's more about how you can get involved, how you can make code better. Uh, and I remember, you know, when Linus said that, you know what, all I care about is that if you make any changes to my code, I just want those changes back. Uh, it's all about collaboration. But collaboration is not cheap, especially if you are investing or if you are kind of engaging in a code base written by some different company. Um, it's a lot of work. Since you folks, Rackan, play a big role in this ecosystem, what does that mean for a company of your size to get involved uh, 
to collaborate on these kind of uh, projects and products. Oh boy, my goodness. What what you're hitting is something that I observed back when I was in the open stack board um, and, and all the open source work I've done. It is much more expensive to collaborate than people realize because you have to be prepared to take somebody else's change and incorporate it into your system. And then you have to, the, the, when you take that change, you take the responsibility of maintaining that code forever and incorp- making sure it doesn't break other people, right? There, there's actually a significant amount of work in building collaborative software, in testing it, sustaining it, making sure that the changes don't break, right? Owning that code for forever, right? As part of the code base, if somebody you know, just does a, a drive-by change. So, you know, one of the things that we found when we built RackN, because our mission is to make automation shareable and collaborative. That is literally Rackend's mission in the very simplest terms. But to make that happen, we actually had to build a huge amount of infrastructure around the automation to make it shareable and collaborative and reusable and decomposable. All of those things were required to build to fill, fulfill our collaboration mission. And one of the things that you see in these cases is if Companies don't walk into projects expecting that type of collaboration. This is why foundations and doing foundations early is important. Then it is very, very hard to put that back into a project. Um, in, in the HashiCorp example, it might be that one of their competitors wanted a feature into Terraform to make it easier for them to govern Terraform from a SaaS. And HashiCorp is not going to want to take that in because they don't want to maintain it. They might not be able to test it. There's all sorts of challenges here. And so we we definitely see that as being a barrier to creating the type of collaboration people want. One thing I have to say about Terraform specifically that was brilliant is that they used a plugin model so that they didn't have a lot of collaboration challenges across their plugins. And one of the things that made Terraform just so amazingly powerful is that the Amazon cloud provider, Amazon doesn't have to collaborate with Google <laughs> to do their, right? So, so HashiCorp has been the neutral, neutral piece with the, 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 the tool. And then the plugins don't require collaboration except within an individual team. And, and that actually is part of the, the benefits of how those product, that, that specific project gain so much momentum because it didn't require the collaboration. And this is why I think that your point and bringing up the question about collaboration is so essential here because the things that work really well are understanding what parts of the project, the code base, you can have collaboration around and how those are going to work. And it actually might be one of the things that makes an open TF project very hard to do because the people fostering that project actually might quickly figure out that they can't collaborate around certain parts of the pro- around the code base because they each have different needs for it. Um, but, you know, that is what makes a project successful in short is getting the stakeholders um, who are going to drive and invest in the, in the code base to be able to have a way to agree and share what those priorities are. And that is literally the life or death of any of these open source projects is how well they collaborate. Right. Um, one of the things that makes Linux um, work is Linus uh, is that arbitrator and, and helps drive forward how all those things work. And, um, you know, we, we often talk about that. I, I think people consistently forget how um, hard collaboration is. And on the flip side of it, what we see with RackN is they also forget how uh, strong the ROI is on collaboration. So, you know, when we see teams collaborating, when building the infrastructure to do that type of collaboration, the ROI on the code on a collaborative code base is actually significantly higher than an ROI on a on a single owner code base. Um, And that's that's part of the magic of being able to make make it work. But it's not free. I mean, I am a big proponent of open source, but the fact is this is also the reality we live in the world of proprietary and open source code because I would love to see more and more code open source, but the reality is that uh, these kind of things where companies will change their license will continue to happen. Uh, I feel that maybe we are going through a transition just like the early days of open source and uh, companies are trying to find a balance between SaaS and the old licenses that were written in for the old world. Uh, but once again, I want to focus on customers that how are you folks at REC and helping 
your customer so they don't have to worry about these changes, which I said I feel will continue to happen? Oh my goodness, that's an important question. And vendor neutrality is actually a major theme for, for what we try to do and for how we help our customers and what our customers ask, right? It's, it's a big part of what they want to be able to do with supply chains. Um, and so the, the, the simple model for us is to always evaluate the abstraction of the tool or the thing doing the work, right? Terraform is a provisioner. Uh, Ansible is a configurer. Um, right, that, that those patterns are actually pretty universal. And so when, when Racken, our architecture is based on finding those common dynamics and then making them repeatable um, across, across the board, but not so locked in, right? It, it, the challenge with abstractions is that you can overdefine an abstraction and, and, and make it impossible to use, right? You, you end up with a least common denominator. And so what I, would, what I would suggest based on our experience with customers is be very, very careful and ask hard questions about if you are using and you need to be using a, an abstraction to protect yourself from these changes, because that you're right, they do keep coming. You need to make sure that that abstraction is flexible enough that it doesn't become a least common denominator thing. You should always be asking your API layers how do you handle if I change a core component? How do I make sure that I can leverage the capabilities of the systems that are underneath this abstraction fully? And that ultimately is the big question here, right? That, that insulates you from these types of changes is you need an abstraction and then the abstraction has to be leaky enough that you can always go back into what's under that abstraction and fully leverage it. Because a least common denominator abstraction, like we've tried to do with cloud before Terraform over and over and over again, those least common denominator abstractions um, really fall apart very quickly. Um, and that's fundamental to Racken's architecture is this, this sort of recognition that complexity is not something you can remove from systems. We actually embrace complexity. And so at the core of everything Racken has built is this idea that we have really strong abstractions and those abstractions are very easy to break through and then set the machines that are at the base. So the, the abstractions are helpful from a control perspective, but they're very weak from an exposure perspective. And that balance has been essential to making Racken uh, able to control literally any type of infrastructure on the planet. Um, but it takes a lot of deliberate design. And I think that, you know, even for people you know, who aren't Racken customers who are listening to this problem, this, this, this discussion can come back and, and look at the abstractions that they've been building. Think about how, how much it's, you know, limiting them and find abstractions that are better. And if you're missing abstractions and you're, you're panicking because you know, all these changes to open source projects you depended on are now exposing you know, uh, brittleness in your infrastructure, the first thing to do is to actually build those abstractions up. Um, and we're always happy to talk to people and show people what we've been doing. And, and we're very proud of the, the platform it's called Digital Rebar we, that we've built that enables companies to create that type of abstraction and, and have supply chain uh, independence and control, even in, as they have very dynamic infrastructure. And I just want to hear from you that, are you worried about these changes or you feel that, yes, this is just a transition phase and things will settle down? Or you think that uh, companies are being pushed to a corner due to SaaS and we will see more and more of this. Uh, we may even return to proprietary uh, source uh, software. What are your thoughts on this? I, I am worried in that I think that we we have to reset what we expect open source to be, um, and I think that you know we uh, open open source is an amazing place for certain types of systems where that you have a shared interest in a collaborative environment um, to really grow and improve, and um, I think that there are places where those are those are very powerful forces. I think that um, we we see a lot of companies who are seeing open source as free software, and they end up building their own custom bespoke versions of you know systems because they're trying to take advantage of free products. And 
right? Everything we've done, we've come back to this idea of collaboration, 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 right? And so the, there's, there, I do think there's some warning signs that people look at free software or open software as free, and then they make a copy and they forget to collaborate. What is your expectation from open source, actually? If, if you were using open source software, you should be thinking through how am I collaborating with the community around that software? And, and collaboration might be I've paid a vendor <laughs> to uh, you know, standardize and, and be my voice. But you know, that's, that's an important thing with, with people. They, they need to be looking at open source as a, as a point of collaboration and getting the benefit of collaboration. Um, and that's, that is really the way we need to think about it. I do, I do believe right now there's a lot of people who, who hear open or hear open and think free, um, and including vendors who've taken, you know, we're, we're talking about HashiCorp, who've taken a lot of HashiCorp products, what HashiCorp thinks of as products, what they published as projects, and then embedded those projects into their business model. Um, Without, without anticip- you know, maybe, maybe not worrying about when, when that collaboration tax would come to. Rob, thank you so much for a very pragmatic, uh, and once again, the focus is on customer discussion uh, to, to also realize that this is the new reality. But the more important thing is how do we help customers navigate through some of these challenges? Thanks for all those insights. And as usual, I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it, Swap. Thank you.